for dinner. Um, Professor Larry Lake, who is currently the ULA Chair in Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT, was a, a co-captain with Tom. Uh, he was the chair of the department in the other side of the building. And uh, he's also a longtime collaborator, having worked with Tom on reservoir modeling and optimization of well production for, for a long time. And so I'm so happy to have him here um, recount his, his experiences working with Tom. Thank you. <laughs> I, I figured he'd bring that up. You know, Tom, uh, I should have taken a bet as how long it would take you to mention that. I uh, asked uh, Tinsley Odin for a joke before I came up here, and he gave it to me, but I can't use it. Uh, <laughs> but since this is largely a chemistry-oriented audience, uh, I will tell you a joke you've probably heard. This is the story of the two hydrogen atoms that are sitting at a bar. One turns to the other and said, I think I've lost my electron. Second one says, how can you be sure? The first one says, I'm positive. <laughs> well, that's a better reaction than I expected. <laughs> OK, Tom, 40 years of a successful academic career, and I sent this over to Anu, and she immediately called me, and she said, uh, well, actually, it's 50 years. <laughs> so there it is. And so, huh? What? Yeah, you keep trying. So I want to emphasize this is camaraderie. I think you can see that everybody here talking about how, how friendly we are, companionship. But I want to emphasize collaboration because I am, after all, from petroleum engineering, petroleum and geosystems engineering. But I just couldn't resist. So here, the early years, Tom and Jay Hogg. Oklahoma State Science Fair. And as I studied that picture, I could not believe how much he looked like Jeff Edgar, who's sitting right up here. So Jeff, behold your future. <laughs> Family. I guess it's Becky, right? Yeah, OK. And uh, braces, Jeff, really? That's Jeff? Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> so I just thought, well, it's nice to talk about awards. And uh, I don't know what that award is for, so I just thought I'd put it up there. Do you know what it, do you know what it's for? I don't know where you found that. That is you, right? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> okay. But this one I do know. That's in a E induction, right? That's Bob Brown. He's a University of Texas uh, alum. Yeah. Yeah. Very successful. Well, I have a lot of fond memories of, uh, did I say that, fond, fond memories of uh, Tom, but <clears throat> some of, many of them are, are uh, centered around while I was chairman. I think he was associate chairman, associate dean, right? And uh, during those times, we used to go uh, once a year to a, a retreat. They called them advances because the College of Engineering never retreated. <laughs> And we would go to a place called Purple Sage, which is a beautiful place, lovely place, about a three-hour drive from here, just gorgeous. Uh, everything was very nice, the furniture. I always drove away from there feeling achy all over because the doggone furniture was so bad. The dean at the time, and I won't tell you his name, but if you can decipher the phrase scion of a lumberjack, you can probably get it. The dean at that time was, like many administrators, uh, looked, took these opportunities to exchange, uh, uh, to exchange uh, information, mainly in the form of minerals. And boy, he was big on it. So we would walk away from those retreats with a stack of papers about that high, like we were going to read them, right? Read 
But Tom solved it because he uh, got to where he would bring a, a box, and every time we'd cover one thing and we'd be over it, he'd toss it in the box, toss it in the box, make a big note. So uh, there's the box, Tom. All for you. Right? It's not really the box. <laughs> OK. So <clears throat> I'll speak about collaboration, and I'll speak about it uh, from this standpoint here. Uh, these are all the, uh, and, and sorry, Jim, I'm get a little, I will get a little wonky here, OK? Um, these are all the folks that has, has worked on this project, and I've put in, uh, uh, put in, uh, in parentheses where I think they are. The ones that are shaded in orange are chemical engineering students that Tom and I co-supervised. And I found out right just a few minutes ago that that one's wrong. It's Exxon Mobil because John, John Kim is here today. Where are you, John? Show me your hand. I saw a hand. There he is. OK, right there. OK. So that needs to be changed. He's at Exxon Mobil now, right? Right. And on the right side, you see the current people. This is an ongoing project. And a, uh, I, I hope will ultimately prove to be a successful project. But bear, bear with me. I'm going to show you some equations. It, uh, I was fortunate to have a fair amount of consulting work uh, through the uh, uh, University of Texas and through uh, various consulting firms, one in particular here in town. And I will say uh, uh, <clears throat> that has been very profitable. Can't tell you how many class exercises I've had come from working on consulting projects, how many times I got sets of data that I could use in consulting projects and other things. So it's very good. I had a recurring experience where a, uh, a, uh, an operator, an oil field operator, would come to this consulting firm and they'd say, I'd like for you to do a simulation of my field. I want a really hot shot simulation of lots of computers and things like that. And so we'd say, yeah, we'll sit around the table. We can do it. And so let's start off by asking you uh, where, do you have any seismic data for this field? Uh, anybody know what seismic data is? Good, good. They say seismic what? <laughs> no way. You know what I'm talking about, Jeff, right? Exactly. And so uh, we'd say, well, do you have uh, any uh, any logs? <clears throat> and they say, yeah, we have, we have a lot of logs. Uh, but uh, they're, they're all taken back in the 1950s. So there's not much use of it. OK, well, you have any core data, any cores? And they say, oh, yeah, a lot of cores. Uh, it's up in a warehouse in Tulsa. We're not quite sure where it is, but we know they're there. So the upshot of it was, when you get right down to it, the only data they had was well rates. Sometimes they didn't even have that. Okay. Sometimes they didn't report their water production rates or their gas production rates. So I uh, scratched my head for a long time, tried to come up with a, a method that would be useful for folks like that, because they're still producing quite a bit of oil. Uh, all these are legacy assets. That means it's had several owners over the years. And so <clears throat> this is the project that I'm going to go over, and Tom uh, uh, was and I collaborated on on this as part of it here. So well, the picture on the right over there is what you call an oil reservoir. It's actually mostly rock, but we'll call it an oil, oil reservoir. And the equations in the upper left are a continuity equation. You remember Bird, Stewart, and Lightfoot, don't you? Continuity equation? Yes. Okay. And next to it is production rate. And so uh, oh, I should have prefaced this by saying the industry has developed some extremely sophisticated mathematical models that uh, have basically now, if you're a Ramco, has literally billions of cells. Each one of those cells requires about 10 inputs. And I'd say about 98% of those inputs are not known. So I think we're proud of it, but we're unjustly proud of it. It just means most of the input are defaulted out. You're not really simulating what you think you're simulating. So I wanted to step back on this, and I wanted to um, combine those two equations to form an ordinary differential equation. Here's, here's a joke. Let's see if it works here. 
This is an ordinary differential equation of the type that you encounter every day in your work. When I do that in front of an industrial audience, they laugh <laughs> because they can't even spell ordinary, much less differential, right? So that describes that, and here is it's a, an analytic solution to that equation. It has three terms, one representing primary production, the second term representing water induction, which is that, that part right, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Push the wrong button, I knew that would happen. One that, uh, I did it again. Represent, Dad, got it. It's faster than I am. One representing the uh, injection rate of water, and this is for a water flood. Most legacy assets were water. And so the idea is that if you could, uh, uh, if you could, uh, if you knew the water injection rate, and that's not always there, you know, uh, and you knew the production rate, you could actually fit that simple equation to. Uh, to the data. Now we're talking about quite a bit of data because many of these fields were discovered back in the 1950s and they have daily oil rates since that time. And some fields have 100, occasionally even 1,000 wells. So I like to say, people, we were big data before big data was cool. Okay? And so uh, <clears throat> it's really not a, a, a original idea because in the 1940s, Oil companies used to actually build physical circuits. You can see one in the upper corner there, upper right-hand corner, that were real circuits. And, uh, you know, and uh, so the electrical flow of it uh, uh, would tell them how the field was going to work. It, the, the resistors were permeability, the capacitors were compressibility. And you can see it on the other side there. This thing is, keeps wanting to go backwards here. Okay. And the darn thing worked really well. You can see on the right-hand side, they were simulating, and that's no simple math, a, a test. They were simulating the Guar field, the largest field in the world, in Saudi Arabia. And so all we did was we, we ditched the analog computer, uh, and, and we switched it over to the equations. It's called the capacitance resistance network, and it's just traditional reservoir engineering. Here it is, is that you have a you have a signal, which is in blue. The, you have an, uh, a stimulus, which is in blue. That's the injection rate. And uh, then you just basically adjust the parameters so that, uh, so that they fit the data. And once you fit the data, then you use the, uh, the parameters so calibrated to uh, make predictions and to decide on how to operate the, the field. Uh, we benefit a great deal from the pretty wide, wide open or very much uh, um, advances in uh, automated optimization. And so, uh, you know, we can basically form an uh, objective function. We can do several different things. And at the end of the day, there's no limit to how many wells we can do in a field, how many wells we can do, nor is there any limit to how, uh, how much data we take. And so let me just uh, highlight some things for, from uh, uh, some students, and either is, these are the Kimmy students. Uh, the first one was Dan Weber. And Tom, I think Dan was the one that got us together, because I believe he was sitting through my class and he looked at something like this, and he says, ah, you know, that's a control problem. So here we are. And uh, this basically is, let me go back, this is the case, the, you can see the injection wells in little terms, F sub i, j is the fraction of the injection in well, one well that's reaching the producer. Uh, we, don't long, we no longer talk about porosity, we talk about time constants, we no longer talk about permeability, we talk about gains. This can be done, believe it or not, on a spreadsheet. So, sample results, and I think this came from uh, Weber's dissertation. This is the Seminole San Andres field in West Texas, a couple hundred wells. Green dots and <clears throat> blue dots are injectors, green, green triangles are injectors, blue uh, dots are producers, and those are the gains between wells <clears throat> that are greater than 0.5, okay? It's always prompts a little bit of controversy because you see there's a lot of gains that are going from an injector and a producer, but there's a producer right between the two. And so why doesn't it go to the nearby producer? Doesn't. 
1.2. It's been my pleasure to work with a large number of geologists over my career. So when they see something like that, they begin to start thinking geology. They begin to start seeing channel sands in there, or reefs, or barrier bars, or things like that. I don't know whether it's there or not, but I do know that's exactly expressing how the fluid is flowing through the reservoir. You do remember these things are in the ground, right? Slaughter San Andres is 5,000 feet deep. And <clears throat> the optimization routines work pretty darn well. Here's a uh, plot of the R squared fit for each well. I figure how many wells here. There's two, 230 wells here on this one. It, uh, uh, average R squared is 0.6, goodness of fit. And uh, here's another joke. I deal a lot with petrophysics and petrophysical data. And R squared of 0.6, most petrophysicists will kill for because the data just is not that good. Just not that good. But this is 0.6. And in addition, there's a distribution of time constants, which I thought was uh, interesting. If I could get it to come up there. There it is. Time constants, usually, this is the distance, that, the length it takes for a change in rate in an injector to show up in a producer. And this one, it's about, uh, oh, it looks to be about 50 days or so. So you perturb the injection rate over here, and 50 days later, it shows up in the producer. But a big distribution. We haven't done much with this time constant thing, but I think we're going to do a little bit more with it as we go on. But I'm going to move over to, um, I'm doing really well on time, I think, on An Nguyen, who uh, <clears throat> graduated about 10 years ago. And we tried to get, uh, the, the idea is once you've got the, the, the reservoir characterized, you know where all the connections are then maybe you could go back and make some suggestions about how to operate the field to improve the oil recovery. Now, uh, operators don't like to spend money, OK? Um, so I was trying to think of something that would require no additional expenses, no additional wells, no additional chemicals, nothing like that. And so the idea was to just use the description that we just did, turn it into an optimization. This is where Tom came in and basically just see if you could adjust the injection rates so that the, the rates went up in the producers. And we talked about it enough so that we got a, an operator to do it. So Ann spent the summer with, I think it was Kinder Markin, and here is basically what it shows. This is the oil rate here, okay, this is the history. This is the match. This is what it would do if you didn't do anything around it. And this is what it actually did. Right there. Another way to plot that is, uh, uh, darn it. Is like this. This is the traditional reservoir engineering way. This is the, the rates. This is the history match. And this is the extrapolation of what things would do if you'd done nothing and what things would happen if you, if you uh, did, adopted the technique. Incremental 40,000 barrels, $2.8 million incremental revenue. Not bad, just for changing the valves, right? But uh, Anne did something else that I never thought was possible because I always view this as a injection response to injection. But uh, she worked out that, hey, you don't really need injection. All you really need is bottom hole pressures. And so, in fact, it, as we were discussing this, uh, a former student came to my office and said, uh, well, I've got some, some primary production data where there's no injection. And so Ann went away, and I, I, I kid you not, that was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and by noon she had this. And so she was able to tell what the pore volume, I'm sorry, of each of these sands were, each of these wells, drain pore volumes right there. And that is to be compared to the estimate based upon about six months' worth of geologic surveys right there. Also, you can say something about how the wells are doing because some of them are doing poorly, some of them are doing okay, and then gradually doing, doing uh, worse, and, and so on. So that was really 
interesting technique, and I hope we can pursue this idea to, uh, uh, to uh, um, unconventional reservoirs. And then, this is Zhang Sak Kim. You didn't think it would be here, did you? Right? So he had much like these derivative things. And, you know, and so we, uh, he worked on it, and he just sort of thought, here's the equation you're working with here. But you, know, you can actually integrate the first equation before you solve anything. And he comes up with a procedure that's based on cumulative production rates, cumulative water injection, and changes in pressure. And basically, it's supposed to take care of, and it does to some extent, take care of a, uh, what is a really big problem with us? We get these data sets, and sometimes wells are shut in for months at a time. You don't know whether that's a signal or not, or whether somebody's just, just messing around with the wells. And so he came up with this technique for using things where the data is sporadic. He also worked out a, uh, an optimization or some theory on the optimization that uh, tried to address the business about, uh, non, about multiple optimums. And he kind of convinced me that, uh, uh, that this surface, this optimum surface is convex, and so it really would have only one optimum rather than multiple. We need to talk about that because I don't believe that anymore. Okay. And then the other thing, this is comes, uh, why do I keep doing that? This is Victor DeRuby. He is, uh, he tried to work on this with, uh, we tried to make it work with uh, thermal projects. This was actually suggested to us by, uh, by Shell. I think we, this was a bridge too far for us, okay? So I didn't, as I looked through it, and I couldn't find anything that would be uh, appropriate for an audience like this. So. I just thought I'd acknowledge it. Anyhow, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting ride. And uh, I would say, Tom, you've contributed greatly. Thank you very much for your help. And thank you very, very, very much for your friendship and those things. So best wishes, good luck, stay in touch, OK? Thank you, Larry. So we do have time for a few questions or comments. All right. Good. Let's thank Larry again. And, and, and I would I'd like to ask you to to perhaps take another look at your cell phones and and try to put them on vibrate or or mute if you don't mind. They'll, they'll come and get it. Right. So, um, Jim Rawlings showed a, a snippet from the Austin American Statesman that had a, a memorable title. And it said, veteran UT professor takes over, and I would add, embattled Energy Institute. So the, the veteran professor was Tom. Um, the embattled institute is no longer embattled, but um, it's rather a, a key hub for energy research at UT today. And his partner in this turnaround was uh, Michael Weber who's the Josie Centennial Professor in Energy Resources in our Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, Michael is a class of 1995 UT aerospace alumnus, and uh, his work is in the, the broad energy field. He's uh, very deftly balancing deep technical research with entrepreneurship um, and initiatives that focus on introducing and explaining energy issues to the broader public. And um, even if you're not in the field, you might have encountered this documentary work on PBS or Amazon Prime or, or iTunes. So Michael, welcome. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. You got the slides. There we go. Great. Just use the arrows to record. Uh, okay. 
good to see you. Uh, I just flew in from New York, and boy, my arm's tired, I guess is the joke I'm supposed to say to get that going. And this is the title in the, in the sort of the program about what I'll discuss. Getting the Texas economy to net zero by 2050, a tough task. Texas used a lot of energy and has a lot of emissions. The emissions in Texas are on the scale of Australia or Germany or Canada, so it's a big deal for Texas to consider um, getting rid of its emissions. And so I can talk about that if you want during q and I thought it'd be better to talk about Tom Edgar, so I'll talk about that. And I will note, I fact-checked this beforehand, he arrived on campus around August, September 1971. I arrived on campus in January of 1971, and it's been nice to share the campus with him for 50 plus years. So it's really kind of good to be a longtime colleague of his in uh, the last 15 years or so as a professor as well. And I would say that in my professorial career, uh, Dr. Edgar has been absolutely instrumental for my career development and success every step of the way. I started on campus in the faculty in 2006, officially as a professor in 2007, and we started collaborating essentially in 2008 in a variety of ways. So we've been working together one way or another for many years. In every step of what I've been doing, he's been a partner or a victim of what I've been doing. So appreciate all of that. And it started in 2008 through today with a class called Energy Technology Policy. This is a class he created. And I wanted to teach a class like that as well, so I stole it from him. And I created a class with the same title, basically. I say, it's a great title. I'm just going to use the same title and same kind of scope, the same idea of teaching an overview on energy and having people of different disciplines in the class, different engineering disciplines, but also policy and geosciences and business. So I just kind of took it. And then I went to him after and said, by the way, I stole that class idea from you. Is that OK? He's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. It's great. The class is always oversubscribed anyway. I'll teach in the fall. You teach in the spring. So he was a good sport about me completely just ripping that off from him. And it's really worked well, and it still is running today. We still have two people teaching in the fall and spring. Actually, I'm coming back to teach it in the spring again, in spring of 23. So it's been kind of a staple for these programs in engineering. And this is sort of a snippet from the, the syllabus there. It has man, man, that's management, that's business, and then chemi, under, undergraduate, upper division, as well as graduate chemi, undergraduate, and uh, upper division, as well as graduate mechanical engineering but also EER, that's Energy, Earth Resources, and Geosciences, and then PA is Public Affairs, the LBJ School. So this is the type of class that he created, he had the vision to make, and you let people like me rip him off. So that's the start of our collaboration, where I was stealing from him, and I thought that worked really well. But we took it up a step in 2009 and 10 with an undergraduate course, UGS 303, that's Undergraduate Studies, Energy and Environment Society, where we actually actively collaborated and co-taught a course, the two of us with Dr. Allen, who is here. And this is a snippet from one of our syllabi for that. And that was a great class because I got to learn how to teach from two master teachers on campus. It's really magnificent for me as a budding instructor. And that was a large format class with 100 people. And Dave, I think you have 200 people now or something like that. So some different version of the class. But these are large format classes. And I would say that the course is popular because the topic is really popular for students. They like energy, they like environment, they like society. And so it was great for me to get to collaborate directly with Dr. Edgar and Dave Allen on that and learn how to teach. We have such different styles, different approaches. So that was another part of our collaboration. In 2009, we started collaborating around Pecan Street. Pecan Street Project is what we first called, or Pecan Street Incorporated, this nonprofit industrial consortium here in Austin, Texas. Here's a snippet from their website I grabbed today. Groundbreaking data research and product testing that accelerates the development and deployment of innovative climate and conservation solutions. We think of it initially as like a smart grid consortium. And this was launched in 2009 when the smart grid was mostly kind of like a buzzword, and now it's more common. And it was, had like a very interesting timeline for its development. It started around 2007, 2008. There was a group of people that helped launch it, namely a city councilman named Bruce McCracken, who was running for mayor and kind of wanted a platform to run for mayor. And smart energy is one of the things he wanted. And he did not win the mayor's race, but was still active as a city council member, helped launch this. And there are a few people from UT, including myself and Isaac Farkas from the Austin Technology Incubator. And we had the Environmental Defense Fund, Austin Energy, and a sort of beloved CEO, Roger Duncan, there. And the Austin Chamber of Commerce with Jose Becerro. Some of you might know some of these people. And this is a very Austin thing, by the way, this like collaborative approach that we can all get along. And I, I sort of attribute this to Willie Nelson who in the 60s and 70s could get the cowboys and the hippies to listen to the same music, and that was kind of a breakthrough for collaboration, and we followed in that model ever since with Semitech and with Pecan Street as well, you know, other consortia. And the way you see this with the business groups, the Chamber of Commerce and the environmental groups in Austin collaborate. That doesn't happen in a lot of cities. So this is kind of a unique thing, the way this got launched. It actually was incorporated in 2009 with the first money from the Cockrell School, which was very sort of, I say, forward thinking of the Cockrell School to seed this 
organization with money as well as CAPCOG, if I remember correctly, the Capital Area Council of Governments, put in a couple hundred thousand dollars just to create it. And it actually earned nonprofit status in 2010. It takes a year or two to get your nonprofit status. And then it's like running. And then it brings in tens of millions of dollars, $10 million or so from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, some foundations, some industry. It's a big fundraiser and supports a lot of research at the University of Texas. And it's really been sort of a great partner and still a partner today for UT. So this is like a really cool thing that got launched. And I found in my records the actual letter faxed. If you see in the upper left, it says the fax that came in. I mean, people are still using fax machines in 2010, apparently. And this is the IRS letter saying it's now a nonprofit and it can be treated under the 501c3 section of the tax code, which is really great. So Pecan Street got up and running. Uh, what I didn't mention in that timeline is that in 2009, I was fired from the board of Pecan Street. Uh, and Tom Egger took my place. I was replaced by a better man. And it was actually kind of an awkward story in many ways because I got a call at home from then Dean Greg Fenves on my cell phone. And like, I'm about to answer and I tell my wife, Julia, I'm so excited, the Dean is calling and he knows who I am and he knows my number. This has gotta be good news. And I pick up the phone, Michael, it's Greg Fenves. Uh, I'm firing you from the board of Pecan Street. You're too young, we're gonna give it to Tom Egger. Which is kind of like the most bizarre kind of firing to have, by the way, it's, I would say, Mostly the last time I'd been fired, I think. All right, so Tom took it, and I was kind of all out of sorts, and I was like, don't worry, you're, you know, get tenure, I'll take it for a few years, you can have it when I'm done, which I thought was very kind of you. So uh, the best kind of thieving is from a friend, I thought, so that worked out really well. So we sorted it out, but it was a very, like, a bump in the road, and I thought, oh no, I'm getting fired by the dean, I'll never get tenure, my career's over, and all that kind of stuff. It worked out just fine, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, as a part of the Pecan Street, there was a collaboration with the IGER program, National Science Foundation IGER program on smart grids. And this was a program for which Tom served as PI, this big initiative. Although there's actually more to the story, it wasn't initially PI, but then kind of came in and took over as PI, which is something, is a recurring theme. He took over on the board seat of Pecan Street, and then he took over as PI of this program. But the IGERT program is Integrative Graduate Education and Research Traineeship Program. This is a paragraph from the NSF description of what it is. The IGER program has been developed to develop, okay, we can make fun of the English there, leaders and creative agents for change. The program is intended to catalyze cultural change in graduate education for students, faculty, and students by establishing innovative new models for graduate education and training in a fertile environment that is so rep repetitious for collaborative research that transcends traditional disciplinary boundaries and it's also intended to facilitate diversity in student participation. This is great, it's multidisciplinary, it's forward thinking, um, it is focused on diversity. Today, I think people are much more attentive to diversity than they were in 2009, so this is like ahead of the curve. It is a great program NSF put together, and Tom is our PI. And this program was really incredible. It had a cohort of students we'd select as IGERT fellows. So the funding was really all about the students, not the projects, which a lot of times in universities, the funding is about the project or the professor, not the students. This is very student focused, which I think is the way it should be. And we had these cohorts of these fellows and they worked on smart grid problems or smart water or smart transportation, smart something kind of problems. And we developed dedicated curriculum. That's kind of one of the inspirations for making sure the courses were always available the right way. The courses were created. They had weekly meetings and trainings on different topics, and they had internships, so it was really a great experience for the students, and they have done very well with it. And this is one example of the external advisory committee meeting we had in April 2011. It feels like forever ago now, on the 10th floor of ECJ, so a neighboring building. On the right were some of the Iger trainees, some of the students or their affiliates, and some of the are just great students. And Dave Tuttle is still here at UT at the Energy Institute. I don't know, he might even be in the room. And then Wesley's at a national lab. Charlie launched a consulting company. He's working a local company uh, doing energy building design. Robert Ferris is redesigning the American grid rules at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Josh Rhodes is still here at UT doing research, is in the press all the time. And so just a lot of great students doing great work, beneficiaries of Tom's leadership with the IGA program. And he built a good external advisory committee of people from industry, a couple different national labs, uh, the local utility, some universities, and we'd meet everyone and get their feedback. And he also built great staff, great team here at UT with Pam and Darlene and Sarah, and Sarah's here in the room. And Sarah had a variety of roles as sort of part of the team for Tom Egger, but also for, for Iger. And what's interesting there is I stole her from Tom. So I got him back for the board position, and that, that was awkward too, but we worked it out, so these things happen. And uh, we're all friends still, which is great. So that was Iger, was a big part of this. And then we had the Energy Institute, 2013 to 2018. Uh, I think Michael called it, uh, the word was embattled. 
I use the word scandal. It was a national, international news story. It's still tough to think about, but there was a problem that happened on campus that had nothing to do with Tom, and it led to so all sorts of bad attention about uh, perhaps some academic integrity problems and failure to disclose interests while doing stories, and the, some key people left UT or left their positions as a consequence. And Tom was basically brought in as the new leader of the Energy Institute, and he brought me in as a deputy as part of the cleanup crew. This makes it like, we had to turn things around, and had to fix some structural issues and set the institute on a new trajectory. And I would say, frankly, between us, uh, had to get rid of some people and keep some people. So there was a lot of like staffing and personnel that was part of that. And that's one of the things he would do is he wasn't afraid to turn something around and get it going in the right direction. You know, to kind of assert his leadership in different spots. And, and that was really great. And I think the Energy Institute is in a better spot today. Um, we had a lot of collaborations. We had UT Energy Week. We did the Energy Journalism Workshop. We did a big project on the full cost electricity. We had all sorts of research support and partnership. Oh, you see the fun fact now? So Tom had this, we had this lovely office over at the Flon Academic Center named for Peter T. Flon, which used to be the, the ugly undergraduate library when I was a kid. Yeah, and now, you know, now Flon Academic Center. We had offices there. And Tom's office had his own toilet. Like, this is exceptional. And like, but a very nice, bathroom, I would say, especially. And so when he wasn't there, we would go use it when he wasn't looking. And <laughs> that was one of the benefits of being his deputy, is I would know when he was out of the office, and I could kind of sneak in and use the toilet. I mean, I mean you got, who, who wants to go down the hall when you got a toilet right there? We, we had suspicions we never proved, so we don't know. But. We wondered, like, he's been in there a while. Do we send in a search and rescue team, or is it okay? So anyway, the uh, Energy Institute was great. One of the things we did at the Institute was actually host Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz. So this press release went out on February 4th, and on February 6th, we'll host Secretary of Energy. This was 2014. This is right when the polar vortex was happening, which was sort of a fascinating time to have a Secretary of Energy here in Austin, right where when there were energy crises around the nation. The grid was failing in many places. Roads were icy. And it was a, like people couldn't get propane in the upper Midwest, so they were in their cars overnight just to get the warmth of the car engine. So it was like a crazy energy crisis, and we had them on campus. It was really great. And here are Secretary Moniz and, and Tom Egger. And if we could just take a moment to make fun of Tom for wearing his name badge while taking a picture with a cabinet official. But not just name badge, but kind of rotated, right? A little cattywampus. And here we are, and of course, towering over Ernie Moniz. But it's great to have a, a sitting cabinet official. There, something important in this picture is one of these people had just found out a few hours before that he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. That was the same day, and that was Tom Edgar had been selected earlier that morning, or had been announced that he'd been selected. So we have this distinguished cabinet official on the left, and then Tom Edgar on the right, the National Academies, but only one of them is National Academy. And so we all knew that. We were kind of celebrating that. Here they are. And we thought, okay, they're both at the top of their field. They're both good scientists and researchers. They both command a lot of respect. The one on the right is a National Academy member. How do we get him to be on the left as a cabinet official? What is missing? What's the difference between the two? And we thought about it, and we thought it's probably going to be the hair. So if we could just switch it, <laughs> then we assume Obama will call, but he never did. So I, maybe you need more than that. You can kind of toggle back and forth. It's actually not a bad look if you want to consider it. So. so I might just leave that up there for the rest of the talk. So it's nice to be at the Energy Institute with Tom hosting cabinet officials. We also had the Energy Journalism Workshop for a couple of years, which is, one of the, I think, a fun project. One of the things that he and I struggled with and complained about is that whenever there was an energy question in the news, it was always a professor from MIT or Stanford or someone else answering, but not from UT. It was like, we do so much energy research here. We have so much expertise. So why don't the journalists call us? And we realized, well, probably because they don't know us. They went to journalism schools like at Columbia, New York, or they went to Berkeley or something. And so we'd need to introduce ourselves. So we started to host these workshops where we flew in dozens of journalists for a couple day crash course on energy. It was really successful. It was a lot of fun. We had Pulitzer Prize winners and other prize winners. Great journal. Journalists you're reading today came to these workshops. They were a real success. And that was part of like, Tom's vision and his willingness to like, do these things and reach out. And it really changed in collaboration with some of the communications people on campus, our presence in the press, I think in very good ways. And it was never really a press conference or press release. It was never intended like, just to put UT research forward, but just to put in the journalists' minds a Rolodex of experts they can call on when they have questions. And I think that was one of our real successful programs. 
We also launched the Exxon Mobil partnership from 2016 through today. It's still ongoing. It took like three years. We negotiated for how many years? Three years or something. It went on forever. But it finally happened. We, we signed this where it was a really significant commitment of $15 million from Exxon Mobil over five years, $3 million a year to support research that has been continued since then, which is really exciting. And, and if you're an energy researcher, it's hard to get resources. And so having people commit the resources is really important. And it was all very technical. It was all about solving these problems. And for ExxonMobil, a lot of it was how to reduce carbon emissions, how to improve safety, how to include more renewables in their oil and gas production, sort of fascinating projects. And so we worked on that, and that was one of the successes that Tom had at the Energy Institute. And here we are at the signing ceremony. With pres now, former dean became provost, now president, Fenves, and Sarah Ortwine from ExxonMobil, and a couple other officials from UT, and Tom and I are in the back. Look, all of us are like smiling and looking at them signing, and Tom's got the dead stare straight ahead. Do you see that? Like he's got the three mile stare. And now look at his stare in this photo, and the next photo, it hasn't changed. Like everyone else is smiling and happy, and he's just like got the, the, the focus, which I think is great. So you can kind of go back and forth. Like he hasn't, it's, yeah, look, he's napping, standing up, yeah, exactly. but like there's no change. And look, the rest of us are smiley, like, yay, there's money, we're gonna do research, whatever, and he's like just focused. And then we celebrated out on the tower with Sarah and Michelle Thomas there, which is kind of fun. And look, he's even helpful, he gives directions. So he, I don't know what you're pointing at there right now. But and you know, he holds people's attention, he's got us all focused on what he's saying. And I really like this photo. He's laughing, everyone's laughing, Jack Randall's trying not to laugh there in the middle, and then there's Gary Rasp in the corner, but he clearly were, people are cracking up. He said something funny, and it's happening again. He's still laughing, right? He's just a, a fun guy, and I think that sort of is an honest snapshot of who he is. We also did the full cost of electricity study, a big multi-year study, multidisciplinary, transboundaries, all the stuff we said with the IGER program, but now doing it with the full cost of electricity study that basically that Tom was the internal sponsor for from the Energy Institute. And we released it with a great fanfare right after President Trump was elected. Now, this is kind of amazing. We, did a, we went to D.C. and we did like a press conference and a briefing and we we're gonna meet with all the congressional staffers. We did it December 8th, 9th, 2016, a month to the day essentially after Trump was elected. No one was interested in talking energy policy at that time. And be, it always happens if you have a, a transition from President to another that people are trying to get out of town. It's December, like they gotta get home. They don't wanna hang out and talk to policy wonks about their latest research. But I say that especially after the Trump election, there is gonna be a lot of turnover from one party to another. So we, Organize this big event, and we got a huge room. We're going to present our results, and we're inviting all sorts of elected officials and staffers. And we had one staffer show up from one Texas congressional the, uh, office, and I think he showed up because he heard no one else was going. So one person showed up just to be polite, which is kind of an awkward way this all fell. But what's interesting is this research ended up informing a lot of the energy legislation that came out in the Trump administration. It's still informing what's happening now with the Inflation Reduction Act and other things. People still use the calculators that we built from this to think about the costs of electricity and to think about some of the cleaner options, especially if you internalize the cost of pollution. So this research, despite falling with a thud with our live launch there, although we did get to meet Wolf Blitzer at dinner on December 8th at the Palm, which was kind of fun, um, we end up having a lot of impact for that, which is fun. We also co advise a student, Dr. Corey James, for a few years. He was here for his PhD. Here he is, uh, April 10th, 2017, defending his dissertation, a chemical engineering PhD student who's now a colonel, professor, Dr. Corey James. He went to West Point's undergrad. He came to UT for his master's. He taught at West Point, came back for his PhD. Now he's teaching as an academy professor at West Point. And the academy professor position is one of the best positions in the military because it's one of the few places where you can be in one spot for like 20 years. So he'll probably close out his career there. And we're still in touch with him, and I go visit him every once in a while at West Point. Like, great student, great professor, working with a lot of cadets. And he sent in some really nice comments. And this is what he says about Tom Edgar. Oh, I'm sorry, some bottom is getting covered up. So this is Corey writing to Tom. I've told you this, and I would share this in person if I were to make it, he couldn't be here today. He's actually dropping off a son at Texas A&M, who's starting a college right now, so we all make mistakes. And I've told you this, and I would share this in person if I were to make it, but you had a profound impact on my development as an academic. Thank you for trusting in me, being patient, and helping me to see my potential. Your influence through me will continue to impact countless cadets. They have 4,000 cadets at the academy at all, at all times, and he teaches, I would say, like a significant fraction because he's teaching a lot of chemistry courses and other things. So you will impact countless cadets for years to come that are literally the future of our nation. Congrats for a wonderful career, but more importantly, thanks for the impact you've had on so many. I think it's a really nice comment that he shared. And, it's probably held by a lot of people. And I would say the overview looking for backwards and forwards is that I, uh, I stole many things from Tom Egger. He stole my board seat, but I stole his class, his secretary, his time as a co-instructor, mentor, collaborator, and his bathroom. So I would say we're basically even. 
And I've learned many things from Tom over the time. Uh, picking good people, he focuses on picking good teams and good people, he really focused on the people, and this includes the students and the staff and uh, faculty colleagues and everyone else. He's, he really thinks about who is gonna do what, where we fit in. And then you gotta be there for others, you gotta be reliable and be consistent. He once told me this, and I tell this to my students now, aim for B, don't aim for perfection, aim for B, but if you do it consistently, eventually you'll make the National Academy of Engineering. Like this idea, you just gotta be consistent, do it day in and day out. And I preach this to my students, so I really, that captures a lot, I think, about this. It's around progress, not perfectionism. And he also captures that up with his other view of, he taught me to think outside the box. And I think this is really important because why confine yourself to that thing? But I, the reason, do you, you remember this image from, yes, yeah. Yeah, so he got a card that said this, and he gave it, was it to Claudia, or to me, or you, I can't remember who you gave it to, was it to Sarah, I can't remember who it was. He got, he got a card uh, that said this, I think he knew for cleaning up his messes when he was thinking out of the box, yeah, so. This is a reference to an actual card given to an actual team member, which is, I'm sure, illegal and inappropriate, but I, uh, I wanted to share that with you anyway. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks for all the partnership, everything. I, and I can talk about net zero in uh, drinks, but Tom, it's great to work with you. I appreciate all your, your companionship and collaboration for leadership and mentorship for 50 years. So thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank, thank you very much, Michael, um, for all the inside information about yeah. Tom's office. <laughs> yes, now you know. Yeah, um, we do have time for, for a question or two, inside or outside the box. So maybe cats going to the bathroom is like a recurring theme of your life that we should... Give. <laughs> So we should take inspiration from the cat going to the bathroom and toilet means anything is possible. I, I love it. That's another life lesson we'll add to the list. Yeah, t let us know how it goes. If you don't report back, if you don't mind. On that note. Yes, I mean, energy policy feels very relevant. It's been very relevant. And I guess what you were doing with the class, what I was doing in the class, to say they're both relevant. We're engineers. We have to know policy. We have to know business because they're different parts of the same solution set. And policy can really accelerate solutions or inhibit solutions. And we're seeing that with the Inflation Reduction Act, things that are very energy focused. A lot of it's around accelerating solutions, using policy as a tool. And, and one of the, let me just give one example, one of the policies that's in the way of a lot of energy solutions is around permitting. It's so hard to get anything built. And Republicans for like 40 years would say, we've got a real problem getting things built. We need to reform permitting. And Democrats are finally coming around like, actually, you're right. We probably need to solve this. So a big part of the compromise around the Inflation Reduction Act was explicitly around policy, around permitting, and that will facilitate and enable technologies. Now, sometimes technologies get way out of the policy, so you have to also create new policies to accommodate it, which happens, especially in the world, like I'm thinking like Dave Allen, like emissions monitoring, as the sensors get better, then we can have tighter standards for emissions, for example. So the two really synergistic. And at the Energy Institute, I think our goal was really to be informative and useful for policymakers. Okay, we only had that one audience member for that one release, but we had a pretty steady audience of policymakers at the state, local, and federal level. And I think that's the goal, and I would sort of take that lesson from Tom that we engineers need to be engaged in the world of policy wherever we can. And, and bad policy certainly can trump good technology, but if we get them to work together, then we'll get solutions in place faster. All right, thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. So we do have students here in the audience. Um, 
Some or, or many may have an eye on a faculty position, an academic career. So from 1971 to 76, Tom was a, an assistant professor. And we figured we would um, take a peek at, at his early years. So we have a, a rare opportunity to, to take a snapshot at uh, the early 70s through the eyes of Professor Michael Pale. He's a 1974 graduate of, of our program. And um, after a brilliant 20 year career in industry that um, ended as vice president of Amoco Energy Group, um, this lifelong Longhorn came back to Austin to teach at UT. And he's taught uh, numerous chemi classes that focus on, on applications and uh, plant design. And also since 2013, he was the, has served as the director of, of the process industry practices. Um, Michael's an avid sports fan and golfer, so I'm sure that will come up to some extent. You got that. And uh, he also enjoys watching his grandchildren do, in his words, anything. So, um, Michael, I know that um, Tom had a great basketball jump shot. That's, that's what he claims. That uh, would be a Greg Jim legend. Uh, but we can't wait to hear more and get this blast from the distant past. All right. Thank you so much. Would you like a clicker or did you bring your own props? No, I, I like the clicker. I, I got a few props though. So. All right. First off, I don't want him going to sleep in the middle of my presentation. So I brought him a Diet Coke. We've had, uh, We've had many, many Diet Cokes together we, as we've discussed things over the years, so we'll just break the rules and open them up in here. So. All right. I've never met a microphone I didn't like. I brought a few things so I can make sure I don't miss any of my many uh, discussions. Oh, you know, somebody yeah. signed for this room, right? Uh, uh, or I got, I got I got backups. I got backups, Tom. I got them all right here, so I'll be able to keep. I'll be able to stay focused with this. So uh, I want to talk about Tom because of his 50 years here. Uh, I've I've been associated. Or I've known him almost all 50 of them, about 49 of them, I think. So, uh, but Tom's been a uh, tremendous influence, and I want to start with telling you that like. You know, he's uh, born in 1945, and he's still here today. And so there's a dash. And so everybody has a dash, okay? And a lot of things have dashes, okay? Uh, there's dashes in your life. Hopefully his dash is longer uh, than this. There's dashes in your career, okay? Your career has a, a stop and a start point. Your academic career is kind of coming to an end. There's dashes in your college years, okay? And, and we've had, uh, you'll see there's a lot of my colleagues here that uh, went to college with me. There's dashes in your relationships. But when the dashes kind of overlap and you really start, that's where things really can, can get good. And, and luckily for me, my dash and his dash had a long overlap. And uh, I'm really thankful for that and I'm, I'm happy I can share some of that with you. Right before I met Tom, uh, my dash, I was in college in 1969 uh, to 1971 at Southwest Texas State University where I had a lot of fun, found a wife, you know, came to UT, and then I got, you know, introduced to this, this person, this, uh, the man, the myth, the legend. Now, some of y'all may say that that doesn't look a whole lot like Tom Edgar, but, uh, there was this very tall athletic professor. We thought he was about 6'6". Six, six. He was a little bit different than everybody else. And the reason y'all don't think he looks like this is because no one ever saw him shaved back then, okay? Uh, what we saw uh, was more someone that looked like this, okay? He had this grizzly Adams look. I mean, all you could see was hair and a beard, okay? But uh, 
you know, he, he was very impactful for us. I mean, he, he wasn't a whole lot older than us, but he commanded, uh, you know, he commanded us very, a lot. I mean, and so, uh, on, as you heard, he was Oklahoma bred, uh, grew up in Oklahoma. He went to Kansas, what did you say, 190 miles away? So uh, he had a good basketball experience there, and even though the Jayhawks weren't what they are today, but they were, they were decent, and, and Tom got into basketball. And, and then, as uh, Dr. Jim told us, he worked in industry. Now, 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 you said two years. I think it was three weeks in 68 and three weeks in 69, so I think it was only about six weeks total, but, you know, that makes him an industry person. And so, uh, for some reason, off he, he went to Princeton, and that, that pretty much ruined him. I mean, he got this uh, East Coast influence. And so, uh, you talked about those outdoor classes. Well, they weren't optional. He made us go out as a form of protest. Now, we didn't know what we were protesting, you know. We, we were so naive. You know, we, we didn't have women in our classes. There were no females in our classes. It was all guys. And so... You know, he said, we're having an outdoor class to protest something. So we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have anything to help coordinate. So we just followed him on out there. He pulled the chalkboard out there. And then every now and then he'd say, okay, let's hear it. And we'd go, he'd say, what are we doing? We're going protest. And he said, what, when are we going to do it? we go, now. And then he'd go, okay, now here's how you optimize. And so, but we had to keep going through this protest stuff. And uh, we didn't know why. It's just, you know, something he picked up uh, on, up at Princeton. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, fortunately, fortunately, back then, you could do those kind of things and you didn't get canceled out. You know, today you probably, you know, tried that kind of stuff. They would just cancel you out of the whole, whole university system. Uh, but anyway, that was, uh, that was Tom back then. But I do want to talk about what I, how he impacted my career and something I learned in school from him, uh, in addition to poking some fun at him during this uh, period, but I had him for process controls. And I remember one of the things he talked about, and so the good news for some of you that aren't chemical engineers is I wrote no papers with Tom, so I don't have to go through those with you. I only have one equation I'm gonna share with you. There's been about six PhDs, maybe eight counting Dr. Michael and Dr. Delia. And I think it's about 10 PhDs is equal to one good MBA. And since I'm a moderate MBA, I think there's, you know, moderately good. There's nine, I'm probably good for nine PhDs. Well, that's the only equation you have to remember. Uh, but anyway, what he was telling us about process control was if you drive your car and you only had your rearview mirror, then you're just driving down the road and, you know, you run off in the ditch right and you swerve to the left and you run off the ditch and left and you swerve back to the right. And, and that's how, you know, a control system works uh, if you're just responding to the, res you know, to the stimuli. And it's, it's based on where you have been, okay? And uh, you think, well, you know, that kind of keeps you out of the ditches, works pretty good for the most part, okay? And, and I'm thinking, okay. And then uh, uh, he said, well, then certain situations come up like this where you, you know, you start feeling a little rubbing on the side and then you swerve to the left and that's the last we hear of you. <laughs> so that's not good. So he said, well, how can you fix that problem? And so what he told us was you had to have feed forward, okay? So you had to, you know, open up the screen and get feed forward. And so it was an aha moment for me. Not that I knew anything about controls, but suddenly this guy, this Grizzly Adams guy, as I said, he must be a really smart professor. I'm gonna start paying attention I'm gonna try to take the other classes that he teaches and stuff. So I got on the Dr. Edgar track, okay? So I could, I could learn from Dr. Edgar. And, uh, and if you don't believe that uh, this thing works, if anybody's been in traffic in London, been chauffeured around, or if you've had the displeasure of driving there, they, Dr. Edgar told me, he says, you know, traffic's a process control problem. They don't look ahead and see that there's a jam up, so everybody pulls up and stops. And if you've been around London, they'll start slowing down miles before the accident, and they'll drop the speed limit. If it's, you know, 60 kilometers per hour, they'll drop it down, and you start slowing down before you go, so you never have to come to a complete stop. So uh, I, think of, I was thinking of him after we had the BP Amical merger, 
And every time that we'd have to slow down on the interstate, I mean, on their, or their freeways, I don't call them interstates, I'd go, you know, Dr. Edgar's right. He's, he's still right. He was right then, he's still right, and all this other time. So, uh, wait a second, Tom, I'm getting a call right here. Let me check this. Yeah, he's here. Okay, it was uh, George Soros and his Open Society Foundation, and they wanted to know if that 70s radical professor, Dr. Edgar, is still around because they're having a demonstration down at the Capitol tomorrow. About, and if you can show up about 5.15, they'll give you the T-shirts and the placards, and, the, and they can practice the chants and everything. It'll be on 6 o'clock news. So you, you haven't lost your ability to influence people on the societal level. So take Michael with you because he's in the policy thing. Michael Weber, where'd, where'd he go? There he is back over there. So, all right. So anyway, so Dr. Edgar's... Uh, and then the second, the, uh, one of the applications I really had on process control, this is a picture of a, a, a multi-stage compressor. And uh, as you people probably figured out, I'm a visual learner, so I don't have a lot of diagrams or listings and stuff. I just got pictures. And so if you look real closely, you can see some humans hanging around here. You can see the size. This is scaling, kind of like the PhD MBA scaling. There's scaling. So this is a big-ass piece of equipment. And that wasn't really the uh, uh, piece of equipment that uh, was on our site. This is probably more of a cracked gas compressor on an olefins unit. But it's, you know, we had, a, we had one that's similar in polypropylene. And uh, a, little, uh, a little bit about polypropylene, and please pay attention to this because there is a test later today. And it, unfortunately, it's Scantron. That's the only thing we can do fast enough to be able to get the results. But if you get the highest score based on this, then you get to sit at the head table tonight with Dr. Edgar. So, <laughs> and uh, my able assistant, Professor Densmore, is used to dealing with uh, people that are unhappy. So if you don't like your score, just see him after the presentation. Because I had some really unpleasant years of trying to deal with him as a grader back in, back in the day. But anyway, what is polypropylene? Well, you've probably seen it. You probably haven't seen it, but it's in a lot of car parts. It's under hood. Uh, under body and things like that. Uh, you see it uh, uh, in the back of carpet backing. Uh, that's another good use for it. Uh, you see it on a lot of bottles do its crystalline nature. And you see it because it floats on water and, and it uh, doesn't absorb water. So you see a lot of ropes and stuff in the marine industry. But there's three kinds of polypropylene. Uh, and the kind that's really was bad was the atactic that I'm going to talk about. And what you really liked was the isotactic part because of its crystalline nature. So uh, be, be sure to be able to do these, see where these uh, methyl groups are sticking off if they're on straight line. You know, I'm not going to really go into that, but I just, if you really wanted to know, we could tell you about it. Uh, but what happened was uh, we, ha we had a process and it had a compressor after a flash drum. So you came out of the reactor and some... Uh, flash gas went overhead and you had a compressor. And for those who have never seen a compressor curve, they look something like this. They have a, uh, a, a axis of flow, and then they have one on a, a head or, or pressure that it generates. And uh, anybody that's taught unit ops, like Professor Densmore and myself, Rollins, did you ever get to teach that one? Valdez only does the high level stuff. I know he doesn't do anything like that, but uh, but anyway, we had a surge problem because the compressor would get confused. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't know if it was on this end of the, of the, of the, of the curve or, or the back end. And so it'd go back and forth. And when it, when it would do that, it would create a surge. And so you had this big piece of machinery that was surging. And so uh, I was given the job to solve this flash gas problem. And when a compressor this size surges, it vibrates. And if you're outside, you're going, holy, you know what? And, and you try to get back in the control room as fast as possible. But uh, so I went out there and uh, I found an operator that could fix this problem. And uh, so I watched and I observed, and that's not my best skill. Uh, but, I, but I asked, his name was J.D. Myers. I said, J.D., how do you know how to fix this thing? He says, well, I look at the uh, control chart. He said, I look at the strip chart, and, and when it starts to wobble, I know we're in... For a rough night, I'm going to have to be squeezing off this suction valve the whole time to control the, the volumetric flow through this compressor. And I said, okay. 
huh, that's interesting that this one guy is smarter than all the rest of them. And then it dawned on me, Dr. Edgar told me, this guy's getting feed forward. He's looking at something and trying to fix the problem. So what we did, we, we got a better, you know, strip chart. We did, you know, this was back in the dark ages. You know, getting a multicolor strip chart was good. We got a better strip chart, and we rearranged it so it gave better sensitivity. We could train all the operators how to fix the problem. So that was the first thing that was early in my career and it allowed me to get off to a pretty good start. Eventually, we went to an online wash that washed this uh, atactic polypropylene away. This atactic polypropylene was like taking beet sand and super glue together and mixing up, throwing a little gasoline on top of it for good nature. Another problem that uh, could apply process controls to is we had a reactor. So this just kind of shows uh, uh, a little schematic, but our reactor looked more like, uh, like this one here. And we had a lot of probes into it. It's a gas phase reactor. And so uh, as this reaction took place, since it was exothermic, giving off some heat, we put quench into it to cool it down. And that's how the control system worked. And it should have worked great in theory. And the problem with it was is that uh, uh, the reaction was so intense that the plastic, the high-density polyethylene, would melt and it would go to its melting point, and it would hit this thermocouple, this thermowell, and sense a high temperature. The temperature was so high that it would put more quench, and it would wet the bed, and it, and it just, you know, it was a spiral to disaster, okay? And next thing you know, we're taking this thing apart and putting some new feed in and stuff. Uh, but because Dr. Edgar had been so involved in AICHE, and I was still in touch with him, I was going to AICHE seminars, and I learned about microprocessors. And so they, you know, they hadn't been invented yet. And so, uh, so what I found out was we could do something to, to manage these uh, bent, mic uh, bent thermocouples. So what we ended up doing was put a, we put a microprocessor in. And when most people think of microprocessors, they think of something they see inside their computer, which has probably you know, orders of magnitude more power than what we had. We had some big piece of equipment that was built at our R&D lab, okay? And uh, the people came down and, and put it in there, and it did something magical. It could take three temperature readings and average them. Now, I know that's very basic, but, the, you know, it's something that took a microprocessor to do, and you couldn't do it. And then when the uh, molten polyethylene hit the thermal well and bent it, then we could go out and unplug two of them. Then it would just be averaging two of them. So that was some kind of logic. So... Uh, Dr. Edgar's influence, you know, helped us get this semi-works plant going. Eventually, I ended up getting a patent on a better mixing design for this reactor. So probably one of my first patents I ever got in industry, I can attribute to uh, this thing not working. So sometimes you learn from your failure. But it helped us, it helped us a lot better to, to at least get that far along. Uh, and then the third one was uh, when I was plant manager at Texas City, we had a distillation problem. We had a tower that was flooding all the time. And uh, so uh, at that time, the consortium that uh, Dr. Rawlings had mentioned had, was up and running. So we hired a grad student. He came down, worked on it for the summer. At the end of the summer, we didn't have a problem flooding anymore. So uh, we're able to, to draw back in that knowledge from the consortium to make us into a better, a better site. Uh, and what are, what are other attributes, going back to Dr. Edgar? Well, body hair is real important, okay? It's, it's real important to some people. Now, personally, I have three of them. Well, I did have three. I got two left, and they're both gray. One's fallen out. But there's other people, when they pull on from their shirt, they're just more... I don't know what year it was we took this picture of you, Dr. Edgar, but it looks like you had shaved somewhere in there because it's not what we remember. It was, you know, something like this. So, uh, and I think, I think most of that still exists. If you look on the back of his neck even, you can see a little bit of it. But why this was important was if you took that body hair and you took that basketball knowledge that he claimed to have, you had some kind of athletic beast, something that could go into beast mode, okay? And that's exactly what we tapped into as the AICHE thing. So uh, with Dr. Edgar, that started the dominance of AICHE 
rising up in intramurals, okay? Because we had, you know, we had this guy. Now, you can imagine some 18 or 19-year-old person, and he, he looked 6'6". Six, six. He was only 6-something, but anyway. Uh, and he had this hair coming out everywhere. Back then, we wore the little tank top uniforms and stuff, so looked like the, you know, American werewolf in Paris when he came out. And when he starts body bumping them, man, their shooters just would shut down. So, and so I don't know if we ever beat anybody more than 18 to 13, but, you know, we put him on defense. He could take care of it. So anyway, he was uh, uh, one of our stars. But uh, he's always been a good friend uh, uh, to me. And then when I took this class called Energy Policy Technology, Michael, when I took it, it was energy policy, technology, and communism, okay? Uh, and so he was teaching us all kinds of things. You know, he could teach us how to control the gender of your child if you're having one. Now, we adopted our children, so he didn't teach us how to have children. So, you know, uh, affecting, you know, there was a missing step in there, but we're lucky we got two boys and they're great. But I can remember those lectures he was saying, you know, you don't have to keep going for the third child. You can alter the gender before they're born. And I still don't remember what, the, what his theory was, but it was something around there. But uh, the, as far as the energy policy and technology, uh, when we were building some of these gas phase high density units and gas phase polypropylene units, we had to conform to the, you know, permitting uh, to, to get the permits. We had to conform to the best available technology. And so to do that, we had to start collaborating with others. So looking at what was going on, you know, on campus and the collaborations and seeing all the things he had done, we created some industry groups so we could deal with how we could get permits better. And that's something we learned in that class is, you know, you have to affect the policies and, uh, and, and learn how to operate them. The communism part, it never, I never could use it in big oil. I, work, I went to work for Amico, I retired from BP Amico 28 years later. Every time I'd bring up some of that communism stuff he brought, it just, it just didn't work. So that part, that's the way it was probably, I guess it's called energy policy and energy technology to this day. Uh, and then we came back recruiting. That was one of my top things I like to do. I would always try to plan my recruiting trips on the day he was going over to Gregory Gym to play basketball. And then uh, Donna would take sure, make sure we had a nice place to go to dinner that night. Uh, but then we'd get in those political discussions. And remember that Princeton comment? And it was just, you know, gosh. But, but at least we could be civil and disagree, you know, on things and, and still uh, be friends in the end. And then another thing was, is uh, Dr. Edgar was a really good friend to industry. Uh, he gave us honest feedback on undergrads. We were able to you know, get good people to come to work for us. He was really impactful on the diversity front. Uh, he, he brought in diverse students, uh, whatever you want to call diverse, and we got to hire those same diverse students, so it was a win-win for us. Uh, that was very important. Uh, when, I, when I came back and got to teach, he was one of the two people that came in and actually monitored and gave me some teaching tips and stuff, so he was a, a friend post that, post uh, uh, industry time. And, and then he gave me some great advice and I became director of the process industry practice. I didn't know that uh, who was it that showed all the consortiums that had died off. Okay, well, uh, Tom told me, he said, uh, look, if you're, you're, gonna run a, you're gonna be running a volunteer organization. Either you're gonna grow it or it's gonna die. Now, I didn't know he had 28 examples. I just listened to him because I thought, you know, it seems like a smart guy and I'll, I'll put my heart and soul into it. And so. I just want to report, Dr. Edgar, here's the growth uh, of PIP, and I joined in 2013. So, uh, you know, we, we had, we've gone from 61 members to 120 since in the nine years I've been there. So thanks for the advice. It's made, made it good for us. And as a result, I have a, a couple of PIP things I brought for you. Uh, I brought some, a new hat. I'll just throw this all out to you. So a new golf hat for you to wear. And then I got some other pip bling in the bag, so you can look at that later. So thank you so much. So we have so much money at pip because every time one of those companies join, they have to pay twenty-five thousand to get in, and we can't spend it fast enough. And then I want to kind of close a little bit. This what what's happened 
to you in life because I see a lot of y'all out here got, are young, but you start shrinking as you get older, okay? And so this is a picture in 1993. Down here it says 1993. And Sam Smolik is here. Sam, how tall are you? Six foot. See this guy standing next to him? He's about six foot two. He's not six six. Oh, he'd be, <laughs> and so if you this this happened out at River Place, and if you look long, well, wait. Most people when they say, "Who's that next to Tom?" they go, "Oh, you mean Dr. Edgar? Who's next, to Dr. Edgar? That's Tom Kite." So that's Tom Kite next to Tom Edgar, right? So, and he was a professional golfer. He was doing pretty good at that point in his career. I think he had uh, just won the U.S. Open the year before, 1992. We'll come back to this a little bit later. But anyway, so Sam, you almost had gone to some outing or something. So Sam may tell us more about this later this evening. But anyway, there was that. But that's a nice hat he has on. I recognize that hat. It's my Amico hat I gave him. It's got a little brass tab up on the top. And every time I'd see Tom, it'd be so shiny. And uh, I had the same hat up in Chicago, and mine would be dull. And I figured, he must be having those damn grad students polishing it while they're watching the house. So not only is it house setting, it's polish up all the golf hats also. So, and then once I got on faculty, I got to have a, a joint project with Dr. Edgar. We, we did the ABET. Uh, presentations or preparations for it and so as part of this we were showing them some efficient energy transportation and again I'm six foot but you know and I know he's driving some kind of Vespa or whatever the hell this thing is that all I know is this vehicle right here is the reason that none of us can drive motorcycles across campus anymore because uh, when he started taking this thing all across campus through all the sidewalks and everything next thing there's a big new rule that no motorized vehicles are allowed past uh, uh, the, the security gates and stuff. So thank you very much for that, Tom. We appreciate it. Uh, and then as I look closer at it, <laughs> I started understanding why some of the students get confused. You know, I'd, I'd be sitting around back when I had an office in CP and they'd walk in and say, hey, Dr. Edgar? I'd go, hey, I'm not a doctor. B, I have hair. And then I realized it's these zombie eyes. You know, we just like, you know, no one's ever seen our, no one knows what our eye color is because no one can see it. It's just like they're sunk in there somewhere. But anyway, so. They ever call you Professor Pale? <laughs> so, all right, so uh, let's go back. This, we take this off of his head and then we get him back down to about six feet. And uh, this is what he currently looks like, okay? And if we look, you know, if we added that back on, it'd still be 6'6". Six, six. So, but anyway, he's still a little bit different. Still a really good man. He's done a lot of things, but he keeps shrinking. And pretty soon, it's just heads that'll all be left of us. So this was at a Centennial Golf Tournament. We have our, our main man down here, and we're, we're laying up and down. Unfortunately, Dennis has left this earth. He's no longer with us. Uh, but I do want to share with you uh, some of his golfing exploits, okay? Because uh, if anybody's played golf with Tom, you've probably seen his golf swing, which is a little bit unique. Now, we all know that he's really good at optimizing things. And uh, so what Tom did, because he's a great athlete, you've already seen that, he's done, got good athletic ability, good basketball ability, he took a basketball player's golf swing and says I can apply these Fibonacci methodologies, the golden search, whatever these optimization techniques are and I can apply them and I can be a great golfer. So he chose Charles Barkley as someone to, uh, to if I can get this thing to work, we'll have a picture of Charles's swing. <laughs> Get my glasses out to do that. 
You want to come show me? Okay, try that. You just pull it to the side, I think. I just don't have my glasses, so let's try it again. There you go. I think we got it. Yeah. Yeah, replay. Now, that's Charles Barkley hitting the golf ball. And then I saw Tiger Woods do an analysis of that swing, and he said, that's only because Charles Barkley is such a fantastic athlete that he can even hit the damn thing. So y'all may think that's something. Wait till you see this next one. So so this is Dr. Edgar's swing as optimized by Dr. Edgar. But then when we tried to show it, it says, file not found could be damaging to anyone viewing it. So uh, that's, wh that's where we were, but then Sam came through for us. Sam Smolik found it. So we actually have the swing. And so I'm gonna give some warning. If you have children here that aspire to be golfers, cover their eyes. <laughs> if you're a grandchild and you think Grandpa Tom can do no wrong, cover your eyes. If you think you're a good golfer and you, you know, want to do something with your life in golf, cover your eyes because uh, we're going to see some of you. Beautiful. No All pressure. Right, here, we here we go. You the man! You get a breakfast. Now you can't make this stuff up. He was not. And look, this is after he optimized it. You should have seen before he started optimizing. And c could it be damaging to someone? Well, let me just tell you. Go back to this picture here. Okay. And here you got a better picture of that nice Amico hat, Dr. Edgar, you see up here. But remember Tom Kite, this guy over here, that uh, former UT uh, golfer? And uh, I ran into UT golfer right before COVID. And his, his name was Scotty Scheffler. And so I played with him in the Houston Pro-Am and uh, I helped him with his putting just a little bit. It took a couple of years for it to take, but he's doing okay now. But after Tom Kite saw Dr. Edgar's swing, remember that was in 1993 when he saw it? Tom Kite <laughs> never won another PGA event. That was, the la that was his first major and his last event, and the only thing we can research and find out is he saw Tom's swing in between. <laughs> so uh, anyway. So Tom, what I did want to do is we wanted to uh, we want to get you something to commemorate your golfing uh, efforts. And since I'd had so much luck with Scotty Scheffler, I asked Scotty, what, what kind of putter are you using? He had this Tideless Scotty uh, Cameron putter. And I said, Pip's got a lot of money. So I just said, just take that pro card, order a Tideless Scotty Cameron putter, and it comes back object code unauthorized purchase I went okay maybe that's a little out of the realm of what we were allowed to buy so I said Melissa get an Odyssey two ball putter because that's what I had and since it worked for Scotty I figured okay it could work for you same thing you know object code unauthorized purchase so the next day I went in the office it happened to be one of our days we actually had to go to the office I said give me the damn pro I'm a damn top flight putter and so I got up to the counter and tried to give them the pro card and it says object code unauthorized purchase. Couldn't do anything with it, so I just made you one. So here, if you'll come get this nice putter I made for you, I'll still give you the same putting lessons that I uh, gave Scotty Scheffler, so. But you need to look at it. Open it up. It's got a putter on it. Show, show, show everyone what, what a nice putter it is. So, 
But unfortunately, that Cockrell School of Engineering, uh, Engineering Business Office has us locked down so hard. That's, that's the best we could do. So, but I do, I do want to thank you, Tom. You've been a friend. You've been friend to many of us in the industry. Uh, you know, you've always took a great interest in our career. Gave us great advice. Uh, always there when we needed you. Pointed us in the right direction. You helped our careers tremendously. So thank you so much, and uh, uh, you know, happy for you in your next uh, life chapter. So, thank you. So it took 50 years for Tom to finally be exposed as a liberal, elitist, communist, Princeton, <laughs> East Coast person. Thank you, Michael, finally. Yeah. <laughs> the truth has come out. The truth, as Jim said. And you, you know that uh, communism ruined golf, so many other things. I can speak from experience. So history has a way of repeating itself. And as you all know, and it was mentioned here, um, Congress recently passed the, the CHIPS Act which aims to boost the domestic semiconductor industry. But Tom was doing this 30 years ago. So with his leadership, UT developed a, a very vibrant research program in semiconductor manufacturing and worthy of the Silicon Hills moniker that I often have. And Dr. Stephanie Watts Butler experienced this vibrant effort as a, a grad student, um, co-advised by Tom and uh, Professor Ike Trachtenberg. So she then went on to Texas Instruments, where over a 35-year career um, led to innovations in the areas of control, fault detection, metrology, um, power, and CMOS process and package technology. And then she also worked in um, equipment, materials, reliability, uh, R&D management, manufacturing science, and generated um, lots of IP. So she's recently focused on wide band gap, high voltage, and isolation technology innovations. Um, and she was uh, a leader in bringing together uh, partners from academia, suppliers, um, development teams, and, and so on to make it happen. So Stephanie, we're really grateful for this opportunity to celebrate Tom's contributions to the semiconductor industry. influence the semiconductor industry both in breadth and in depth. And I use the plural of industries because it's not just semiconductor, but there's a lot of different types of companies and industries attached to semiconductor. And finally, I'm going to summarize this in the entire story as being about the impact of Tom's relationships through a network. So let's start with that. So this is a publication network. So it's a from Dimensions platform out of AIP. And I'm analyzing all the co-authorships that Tom has done. So if you look, the total of publications was 405. So he actually has some more that's not even listed in a CV. With a total of 232 different researchers, making for a total of 865 different types of linkages. So you can see there's a great depth. And if you notice, there's color coding. And the color coding shows natural clustering of the different relationships he had in these publications. So this really shows how the topic areas moved throughout Tom's career, not necessarily in time, but what he worked on. But what I like is when you take the names off, you get something that looks like this beautiful blooming flower. And so I'm gonna use that as kind of a, a mantra for my talk today. I'm gonna start with the total depth of the flower and looking at what the impact and the relationships were and then I'm going to go back and say, OK, what resulted in this flower? How did we get the planting of the seed to have a semiconductor focus? What was the fertilization that was happening through partners and also funding sources? 
Propagation, where did the students go and what did the publications have influence on? And the transformations, not just in the types of where we started in the mid 80s, but where do you see other industries being impacted as well? And finally conclude with celebrations, looking at the examples of what has happened, but what's also to come. So I'm gonna start with the impact. So this, I've only had five joint publications with Tom. He will note that he's not sure how that happened, that I only had five, but I managed to only have five. But look at the ci average citation impact is 52.6. That's a very high number. I think it summarizes Tom's focus. Tom was always looking at, don't do something, but what is the impact of something? What is the important research? And that's why his work became so important. And then if you look at the important relationships, this is part of that overall network that I was showing. And the pink is the semiconductor work, all focused around Ike Trachtenberg. So we're gonna now look at Ike. Who was Ike, why was he important? Because Tom wanted me to spike this out. It was through this engagement with Ike who came to UT as part of his retirement transition out of TI. So for five years, TI paid half of his salary and UT paid the other half to do this very innovative experiment. Because when I looked at graduate schools, in the, so I was a senior in 85, 86, and I'm looking at graduate schools, there were very few in semiconductor. And at the time, I already worked for IBM and TI. So I, was, I already knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do semiconductor. I wanted to do control. I wanted to do modeling. That was what I was interested in. And you could see that UT was starting this program with, with Ike. And the experiment was a great success. But when five years was up, the university wasn't gonna naturally hire, Tom, uh, hire Ike full time at full salary. And so it was Tom in his role as chair convinced the university, please keep Tom on board, keep Ike on board, working with Tom, working with the other professors to make this happen. Now, there's a couple of things I wanna mention about Ike. His PhD was not in chemical engineering, it was in chemistry. Ike never let us forget that. He said, you're chemical engineers, he wanted to have sound fundamentals in chemistry. And that was the beginning of what I would say was a multidisciplinary environment, which now is very common. In the mid 80s was a shock that you would have professors with different backgrounds. And not only that, Tom encouraged the students and I encouraged the students, they were co-advisors of many students, to have other professors in other departments. So I had two professors from electrical engineering on my committee because for my topics, which was plasma, processing, semiconductor, control, reactor modeling, that work was in Kimi in some universities and it was also in EE and others. So it was really very forward looking back then. So let's look at where the funding came from. These are the very beginning of Tom's funding. They were with Ike. So the first source was Texas. So the University of Texas providing funding then you had the state of Texas providing funding, and that was my funding source. You also had Semitech. So in 1988, or actually in 86, they decided to found Semitech in Austin. So when we talk about the CHIP Act, all of a sudden everybody's talking about Semitech again and what happened. Semitech came to town and also was funding Ike's work. And what's not listed here was also funding Ike and Tom's work was from SRC. And so you had the state of Texas and what was happening in the state of Texas really creating this, this total ecosystem of control, semiconductor, processing, all these various topics that were very relevant. And that relationship was very close. So one of the things that happened was Semitech, after they founded, actually knew of me just because I had worked at IBM and TI and I had some connections, said, can you come out and tell us some recommendations of where you think Semitech should be doing work. No, I had not gotten my PhD yet. I'm in the middle of my PhD. Tom and Ike both could have said, oh no, we don't want a student going out and doing that. That's what we should be doing. Instead, they encouraged and made sure I was ready, but off I went alone to again convey that message. So I went out there, I provided suggestions. It went really well, they implemented those suggestions. So when I went to work at TI, it was great. The work I wanted to be seeing Semitech doing was happening. We also heard the conversation that Tom would go to meetings, come back from meetings, plop a paper on your desk. So he comes back and he says, you know, Sandia's doing some work. Why don't you figure out exactly what they're doing, including some of the modeling that we all know today, the fluent relationship. Find out what they're doing, 
go see how we can make a connection. So we actually all went out, made that connection, learned how to do cold calls, went out to Sandia, professor, students in tow, and began a relationship with Sandia. Again, because this was something that Tom expected of his students and enabled his students to do. You don't really realize how unusual that is until you talk to other students about it and they're just shocked. They're going, no, that, that would never happen. So you have this fertilization that's happening through funding, and now we have the deep roots in the industry. So you get these deep roots through the number of students that graduated as well as postdocs. So this was a list that Tom had. I have to admit, when I run into people, it seems way more than 20 because I'll run into people that can connect themselves back to UT, to Tom and Ike. But you also had this research that was propagating connections through direct funding. So some of this funding came because students were Tom's students, but not all funding. Some funding came about because they learned of Tom, and then they did this funding. And it continued to grow into the future. So you had MKS acquired Geodynamics, who was someone that Tom had worked with. Rudolph acquired Aventa Control Software, and that was a software that I had worked on while at TI. Rudolph then buys Yield Dynamics, and then they go on to merge, and now they're a very large control company that does uh, metrology tools as well as control called Onto uh, in Innovation. So you see how this depth is happening through the work that he's doing, but I also call this spreading the seed. So this was an article that we all wrote together in 2000. And this plot, it itself had 164 citations, which is a lot, but then I looked at those 164 articles and said, how many total citations do they have? And the answer is they have a total of 4,240 citations. So that is only one article removed, one dimension removed, and you can already see the breadth. This continues to be referenced even today. So 2022, people still refer to this article. If you look at the groups that are referring to this article, you now see, again, this authorship map and yes, Tom's in the center of it, so this means, of course, Tom's people, Tom himself, his direct relationships are referring to this article, but now you see groups that are not Tom, that are not Tom's students, they're natural clusters, and you can see the impact of the articles on other folks, other research organizations that then are basing their work on the work that Tom and Ike started. The other reason I want to mention this is this was an article written in 2000. I was long since at TI for a decade when Tom gave me this opportunity to write the article with Tom. And I think that's another example of that relationship network. It's not one that ends when you leave the door. It's one that continues forever. So how do the roots become worldwide? These are two job advertisements that are both active on the system. The one on the left is with Infineon, that's a major semiconductor company, but the, it's for Malaysia, not for the US, not for Europe. The one on the right, I'm having to glance over here, is with Micron. It's also outside the US, it's in Singapore, and it also is an APC skill requirement job. So we've gotten to the point that this concept of APC and semiconductor was just an experiment. What, are you crazy? How can anybody be doing this? To when you look at jobs now, they're gonna assume that you have exposure to APC, you have some sort of skill related to APC, and they put APC in the job description in order to attract people to the job. So what's the impact on Beyond? So I'm gonna sit here and read. So this is Tom Soderman. He is the CEO of Skyworks, which is, you can tell, I'm gonna actually have to stand over here. So Skywater, sorry, not Skywork. Skywater is a pure play foundry in the US. It's the only US owned pure play foundry. So Tom started out his career in AMD and learned and met Tom during his control days. So this is a very powerful statement. So I didn't wanna be the only one saying this. So Tom wanted to say this. At the 1995 APC conference in San Antonio, Professor Edgar met with me to lay out his strategy to bring automated process control to AMD. It involved educating our engineers and executives while in parallel building a world-class control team seated from the UT student base, of course. And the capability, uh, creating the automated system solutions needed to truly enable this capability in the semiconductor industry. ABC had begun at TI, AMD would take it to the next level. Tom had to dig me a little bit. 
Because of our competition with Intel, APC was in the spotlight and quickly became the secret sauce that transformed our company, AMD, allowing us to become a true competitor in the MPU clock speed performance wars. The rest, as they say, is history. AMD became a manufacturing powerhouse, ultimately creating global foundries, and the rest of the industry quickly followed AMD's path, adopting APC as a must-have technology. Today, you can't run a fab without it. Skywater, for example, is using ProcessWorks, the APC software originally created at TI under the direction of Dr. Butler, is part of the MMST and now sold by Onto Innovation. So I was talking about Onto just a minute ago. To be clear, APC would not exist in the semiconductor manufacturing arena if it hadn't been for the passion and tenacity of Professor Edgar. We would not enjoy many of the electronic capabilities we rely on today without the advancement of Moore Law. Moore's Law advancement exists because of APC. So in 2015, on the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law, I happened to have an article because I talk about this topic quite a bit. And IHS looked at how much money had been created in the GDP in the, 50, in the last 20 years alone. So not the total 50 years, but only 20 years. And the answer was three trillion direct dollars. That was equal to one percentage of the global GDP. So in other words, you've got Tom saying, look, it took APC to make this happen. I will agree, because you had to, Moore's first law is the scaling. The second law that some of you have heard about is the cost point. To make the cost point happen, to have the yields that you need, you need APC. And so if you look at the totality of indirect cost, and that's uh, indirect impact, and that's what I call the industries with a plural, that would total $11 trillion. So this is not something that's a small impact. This is a major impact. And so on the behalf of our entire industry and everyone who relies on it, thank you. That comes from Tom, that comes from me, that comes from the whole industry. Now the other thing that I note here is where Tom is at now, sorry, the other Tom, Tom Soderman at Sky, uh, Skywater, they're not doing the type of work that AMD was doing. This is a completely different type of foundry. But this goes to show how APC started looking in the world of leading edge CMOS and is completely fanned out from there. So how do I know this, not just from my own experience? Well, these conferences, the, the APC conference now continues. It exists in the US, it continues to exist in Europe. There are versions in Taiwan, they will propagate further. And these are some of the folks that talked in the, in the last 2021 conference. So Corvo, which is a non-traditional silicon IC company, presented on control. Siemens Digital talked about applications of machine learning for wafer dicing. Wafer dicing is the first step in the entire flow for doing assembly of the silicon into a package, or what's known as packaging. So where the world started in silicon, it has now moved into packaging, and that's the great frontier. You're gonna hear a lot of words. You'll hear words like heterogeneous integration, MCMs. And then finally, Synopsys. Synopsys started out as an EDA person. They're now very much about yield and what they do in yield. So these are different areas that it's expanded to. We now have industries, not the traditional digital one. MEMS is not listed. At one time, the number one MEM in the world, year in and year out, was TI's DLP. DLP is made internally to TI, therefore DLP from the very beginning was made with APC as well. So what are some of the future plantings? So I'm going to talk about energy. Um, you can tell my animation didn't work quite right. But Tom, you saw Tom's involvement in the energy policy and the Energy Institute and looking at how can UT be a leader in energy? That's more than just oil and gas, that's also power electronics. So it was through Tom's effort that UT recruited Alex Wong, who's an IEEE fellow, very well known in the power electronics area, to come here and he has been growing the power electronics area at UT Austin as well. So if you wanna talk about renewables, when you wanna talk about electricity generation, efficiency in electricity, everything ultimately is gonna go through um, a power converter, and so you can't really achieve what you want with a green planet if you're not addressing power electronics. And with Tom's effort, UT is doing that as well. So what are some of the things that are happening? Well, one, in electric, there's electrification, which everybody knows about. What's electronification? People call that digital, going digital, but it's a whole lot more. So I'm sure everybody at home, you either have a dishwasher or a refrigerator 
or a washing machine that has a whole bunch of electronics in it now. And it wasn't just that they took the electronics and they went from analog to digital. They actually added a whole lot more capability in. All of that is consuming power. So on the left is a graphic from the International Energy Agency. And they're showing how much you have happening in internet traffic and data centers. So I'm using this as an example. And at the very bottom, that line that's not moving at all is energy consumption. So you've got people like the IA, uh, International Energy Agency saying, well, we're going to achieve this because we're not going to consume more energy. And one of the main reasons is because semiconductors are going to become much more efficient. So the compute is going to become more efficient, but the power conversions needed to make the compute work is going to be more efficient. And so here are some of the examples to make that happen. On the right, I was trying to think, how do I show a non-semiconductor audience something that looks really scary? Well, all those different colors are layers. In the beginning, on the left, you started with stuff going just out the top. So you've got currents and flows out the top. Now we're going to have currents and flows coming out the top, coming out the bottom, variety of materials. We're going to take one of those columns, and we're going to put hundreds of them in a single package, and they all have to be perfectly uniform. The first thing that your head screams is, control. How do I control that? And that is going to be one of the big focuses. You generally hear it under the word of heterogeneous integration. I've been in power electronics and analog for a while, so I moved in 2007. It was later that Tom realized, oh yeah, we need power electronics. So the, the nice thing is Tom's job changes so that Tom and I are always in the same field, even as my career has moved through the years. And so heterogeneous integration has existed in the analog space, not the digital space of semiconductors, but the analog space, especially for power for a long time, because you needed to put different things in the same package. So, FEPCON looks at the future of power electronics. It does this every few years. It's a, it's a invite-only type of workshop where uh, people from IEEE Power Electronics Society get together. I helped on the session focused on what are called high volume. So what is sold in really high volumes that's generally related to the internet of everything. So gave the workshop, which was in Iceland this year, then also did a Pell's Day. And Francesco was one of my co-workers, and so my plot's on the left, his is on the right, but he really specializes in looking at these complexities. If these sort of topics, by the way, I'll do a little plug. If they're of interest to you, on September 8th, I'm gonna be doing another webinar for the Dallas chapter to give an idea of what is the internet of everything and how does that relate to power electronics? Everybody thinks of the internet of everything related to compute. It's not gonna happen if we don't have the right power electronics. So now let's look at another new generation of energy efficiency. So you heard me talking about wide band gap in my introduction. So in Asia, it's called third generation. So if you're in the US and Europe, you look for the keywords wide band gap or WBG. So what we're gonna look at now is what's the possibility of APC and YPG in order to make ROI, okay? So in Asia, it's third generation. So Yol, the market's at 46 million in 2020 for GAN. People are probably thinking, you know, what's that mean? By 2026, it'll be 1.1 billion. There's not that many markets that have that level of rate of increase. And then for silicon carbide, which is the other wide band gap, it's now at 1.1 billion, growing to 4.4. Things are changing so rapidly. Yol is one of these types of companies that projects these numbers. They're saying, hey, it's now going to be 6.3. We weren't even high enough. And the numbers for GAN, when they were saying how much we're going to grow, what's your proof? Well, we're doubling this alone. So I can't cite a public, a public a publication that demonstrates that APC is being used in this area. I can show you that if you go, for example, to Power America, and so you heard some of the, the Make USA that was mentioned earlier, one of those is Power America that's focused on wide band gap. You'll see all the control companies are coming now because it is very clear these are expensive technologies. They can be, especially silicon carbide, very difficult to make because of some of the unique processes. And without process control, you are not going to make these cheaply. The other reason I know they're used in GAN is I have switched many jobs at TI. So it got to the point that most people did not think of me as a control person. They thought of me as a product person, maybe even a packaging person, but not necessarily as a control person. 
So we're going through a flow review with our technology partners, and I want to make sure from day one we have implemented what we need to implement. So I ask them what they're doing in control. And the engineering manager goes, oh, I know your background. And he listed off all the various APC techniques that he had already put into place. So he was ready for the question. And I'm sure TI is not the only company doing that. So when I mentioned, by the way, Corvo, that they were a non-traditional company, after that uh, APC conference in 2021, they bought silicon carbide. So they bought United Silicon Carbide. So now they're also a silicon carbide supplier. So you can see these traditional companies are moving into wide band gap, and with it, they will start producing with APC. So in the Maquetta's 21, uh, in the Maquetta's 100th year celebration in 2016, I used this plot. Do you think wrestling a bull is easy? Try wrestling an electron. What I didn't mention in 2016 is try wrestling Dr. Edgar. So if you've noticed up till now, I've had a very nice talk. But you know, most of us have come up here maybe to get a little roasting. So let me share some roasting with you that I hope when you leave, will leave you with a challenge for yourself when you look in the mirror. So when I came to UT, like I said, I was looking for semiconductor. But my first love when I was in high school was bio. But I decided not to major in bio. I come to UT and what I've discovered is Dr. Jojo and some other professors had come, like Dr. Hubble, and they're doing bio. And I'm like, oh, maybe I could get my PhD in bio and kind of go back to that first love. Because you know, staying semiconductor would be really easy. That's my, that's my background. And it was very clear that you know, Tom and Ike really wanted me to join their group. And it would just be so easy to do that. But in the end, I decided I already knew what I wanted to do. I had come to UT because this is what I wanted to do. So I joined Ike group. And I really liked the students. I had met the students when we came to do a campus visit in uh, 1986, quite a long time ago, and spent the whole day with them. I could really see myself as being one of Tom's students. Now Tom, every year after what I call sorority bid day, when you pick your professor, for those of you that have gone through the process, you understand it is somewhat like a sorority bid day. Tom would have a party for those celebrating and those joining. So my husband and I was married at the time. He was an electrical engineering student went to Tom's party, we walked in, and Tom's wife, Donna, walked over very quickly to herself, introduce herself to Kim, which I thought was very polite. And so we're talking, but it doesn't take very long, and pretty soon I hear, Tom, a woman, a woman, finally, a woman! So now I look at these students who had so welcomed me, and they go, yeah, you'll be our first female student. Tom had never been willing to have one before. Now, I'll, right after that, Tom responds to Donna, half a woman, I'm her co-advisor. <laughs> so yeah, there was a little bit of wrestling with Tom over diversity issues and making sure it was an inclusive group. And I have to admit, I was very lucky. All my students, co-students wanted me there. And that made all the difference. So Tom really was willing to learn because he had examples. But I think what we can learn from Tom is he looked in the mirror and he said, maybe it's time to have a female student. And I'm not sure all of us are willing to look in the mirror, address our unconscious, or in the case of Tom, conscious biases, and do something about them. So when I presented in 2016, what I didn't say was I learned how to wrestle those electrons from Ike and Tom. I learned from watching what they did, accepting their coaching. Luckily, my paper reviews weren't quite as many as Wayne's were required. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you for teaching me how to wrestle the electrons, for teaching the industry how to wrestle the electrons, and more importantly, for 50 years of connecting to the future. So we're here celebrating Tom's 50 years, but it wasn't really the 50 years of what he did in the past, but it's how that's gonna be another 50 years in the future and making a green Texas and a green world. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. And we do have time for some comments and Questions for Stephanie.
Tom. Yes. Yep. I and I think it's right. And I'm not sure many people know a lot of the the founders that were involved in the early days of TI in the semiconductor industry were chemical engineers. It's only with time that it's become very focused on electrical. Everybody's wanting the alcohol. Well, you took the words out of my mouth. (laughs) So thank you very much. We can thank Stephanie again. And with that, I would also like to thank all the speakers um, for really putting together such a great program and, and really remembering meaningful moments from Tom's career, meaningful highlights, and just pointing out how extraordinary these past 50 years have been. So that concludes our symposium. Um, We have a reception just outside of here. Please join us for that. And for more discussions and reminisce um, about your experience here at AT. Thank you.